How were you doing it before, before you vibe coded this plugin? Manually, so go to the Tesco website and I would literally be copying and pasting, copying and pasting. Now, oh I, Lord. But with the plugin now, I can just type, type in crisps and do a search for this. And then I just activate that. There you go. And it starts oh going, going through, filling all that information. How long did it take you to build out the plugin, roughly? The first version of the plugin was maybe an afternoon or two once I'd got the interfacing with the API. And starting off with cursor, you had to give it some of the context about in the documentation about how to do a Figma plugin. Recently, since Figma MCPs come out and things like that, I've actually created a new version of the plugin where the UI is looking a lot nicer, effectively, and so I can really... Kind oh, of, yeah. It's much more on brand. And what was your process in Cursor when it came to, like, saving your progress or, like, creating versions and stuff? I've learned from painful mistakes where I've... Hey folks, welcome to Sneak Peek. Today with me, I have the Rockstar designer, Rob, from the Tesco design team, who's going to show us how to use Cursor to vibe code Figma plugins to accelerate and speed up your design workflow. Rob, super stoked to have you on here, mate. Hey, John. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Yeah, Figma plugins. I'm a designer at Tesco. Never written a line of code but beyond very bad, bad code years ago. Figma plugins have always been something that we thought of cool, but I never thought I'd see myself building one of those. And in the last few months, I've, there's, I've built a few. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time just showing you one of them. So at Tesco, the output is often lots of placeholders in your screen. So we know designing with real data is better. You want to show realistic scenarios. You want to stress test designs based on those edge cases where everything's activated versus not to man you normally we would manually do this though but with the plugin now i can just type type in crisps and do a search for this and then i just activate that there you go and it starts oh going going through pl fill, filling all that information can you, can you add Cadbury, what is it, Flake? There's another one, Flake, and there's another one of Cadbury, I forgot. But it's a Cadbury one, but it's only available in the UK. It's not available in the US, and I tried it, and it was so freaking good, man. Twirl, yes, that's the one I'm looking for. Oh, my God, man. Your favorite chocolate. Yes. I mean, it's Halloween, obviously, so we're going to have lots of them. All the different, you've got orange ones. Yeah. And oh, it's, wow. so it's pulling in, it's, pu it's pulling in the name, it's pulling in the image, it's pulling use, it's pulling in the uh, price, the price per, price oh per God. unit and things like that. And yeah, showing all the promotions. Uh, so this has been a massive game changer for us. And, you know, what it also does is it, it supports different tiles. So, well, what we call product cards. So it's looking for layer names effectively. So I can come in here and I can search for jeans. So we don't sell groceries, but we've got clothing and things like that. So I can come in here and do that. And within this one here, it'll, it'll show diff the tiles in a different way. So you've got different image ratios. It's showing the reviews in a different way. It shows the colors. Um, it increased the height of the cards because obviously yeah, the it's a using stuff, yeah. yeah, and it's using auto layout and things like that. It knows when to activate show and hide layers depending on whether that's that data is returned. And then normally I would then just with the these particular tiles you just adjust them to make it look nice. Yeah, and then the other use case we've got is actually is for people when we're looking at baskets and orders, you want to have a load of other products. So if I click on this button here. It generates a random grocery list, which is back is basically doing 10, 15 searches and just searching, picking products from those random searches. So you've got coffee, beef, soup, etc., And then I can fill that and get like, show like a realistic basket as it comes through. Wow. So with this plugin, like you never need to have Lorem Ipsum. 
or just placeholder text and images? Yeah, so there's been a big time saver for a lot of the designers working and prototyping. And also, I suppose, allows you to just see what it looks like in different scenarios and things. And you spot things so much quicker when you're using real data. How were you doing it before? Before you vibe coded this plugin, how were you doing this? Manually. So you'd be going through, uh, go to the Tesco website, and I would literally be copying and pasting copying and pasting now oh I've been, lord i've got to I've got to say though the actual idea for this this wasn't the first version of this pro this plugin i've got to give a shout out to my colleagues alex and karen who created an earlier version of this which kind of gave me the idea so this version is sped up the process a lot so if i go yeah crisps pulls in the data here and here I need to select the layer and then click on the image. So click on the thing, select the layer, replace the title. So this was a massive a kind of time saver for us, but I suppose it got me and the team thinking, okay, that's great, but we know that we're going to be producing lots of lists. So why can't, how can it just generate the entire list for us? So I then took it upon myself to see if I could create a version of this, A, just to test whether I could do it and B, had some kind of other things we wanted to explore. But yeah, the work that they did was invaluable like on the idea and also just getting it started. And Alex was a real help getting me to understand how to actually interface with the API. So this is all using Tesco's APIs. So yeah, so shall I flip over to Cursor? Yeah, how long did it take you to build out the plugin, roughly? The first version of the plugin was maybe an afternoon or two, okay, just through once I'd got the interfacing with the API. And there was a few, you know, I suppose, can't really go back and show you in this history, but you know, starting off with cursor, you had to give it some of the context about in the documentation about how to do a Figma plugin. It knew a lot already, but there were some things that it fell over on times of like certain TypeScript and things like that. And you had to kind of teach it that. But yeah, off beyond that, it was pretty quick in terms of the functionality. But because this was a tool for designers as well, I really wanted to try and make it look as nice as possible. But this is pre Figma MCP. So a lot of the styling of the actual plugin was done by hand. So a lot of looking in the, in the dev tool. So for instance, I might be, I can even see there's something going wrong with this little icon here. So I think it's an SVG. So I'd be coming in here and selecting divs and things like that, trying to work out what was going in the code in the, in this panel, trying to make head understand the code here, then flipping back into cursor. Uh, obviously you use the console a lot to understand what's going on as well, like errors and things like that. So there's still quite a lot of debugging, a lot of copying and placing of errors back and forth because of the plugin works within Figma is a little bit harder for cursor to see what's going on and things like that. But yeah, it was able to do a lot in quite a short period of time. But then in cursor. I think you said that I cannot show you earlier, but then in the left side, you see the graph of it. Can you not revert back to an earlier version and stuff? Yeah, I could do. Yeah, I suppose. So let me see if I get, don't want to bore it yet. Well, but what if we created a branch of it from that version? So it doesn't revert to it, but yeah, sure. Creating a branch would have being a better or like a safer option. It's fine. I'm not gonna. You're not gonna uh, push the changes here. Mm -hmm, exactly. So this is the thing, like the more designers start using cursor, they have to get familiar with the engineering syntax, commit, git. Yep. So now we find a vector figma. And now I just need to, from the development version of that. So it's got a different tab, an additional tab there. Oh, I see. So this is the old. Yeah, this is the, this, this is, is the, the older version, version you reverted back to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in this one, I was actually, I, had, I was looking to beyond just products. I was thinking, could it actually pull in 
the different kind of content we have on certain pages. So this is like the cleansing page. It was pretty buggy, so I basically removed it. <laughs> Ultimately, I don't think it was many people going to be using that. This is where the kind of the main kind of functionality was. And then, you know, having the Figma file, like on the, we have a certain way every designer organizes it. Like you've got pages, you've got different project names, yeah. you got version history. So what was your process in cursor when it came to like saving your progress or like creating versions and stuff? I'd love to say I had a really rock solid process, but a lot of the time it was be, I think I've learned from painful mistakes where I've you know, forgotten to commit a number of times. And then when I wanted to go back, it's been really painful. So I suppose I try and get into the process of committing when I get something working. So whatever, when I get the thing, whatever feature or UI element that is tweaking, once that's, I'm happy with that, I'll do a quick commit. And then, so I can always roll back. Makes sense. Yeah. So just going through this exercise it was a really huge learning opportunity. And recently, since Figma MCP has come out and things like that, I've actually created a new version of the plugin where it up. So where it's just the UI is looking a lot nicer effectively. And so I can really, oh of, yeah, it's much more in brand this way I can actually browse now so I can, I can do a search. And I can search for cheese, or I can change it to one of these things. And then I've, yeah, but alternatively, you can browse as well as actually, I just want to get some treats and snacks. Yeah, things like that. I suppose I've, what I used, what I learned in the first pro, the first plugin, I've now applied to this second version of it, which is built in a mu much more robust way. And yeah, just applying what I've learned into the next project and thinking about how I can apply that in other things as well. Yeah. And then within internally within Tesco, just doing this, the fact that one of there's a few plugins that have been created since then, everybody, other people are getting interested in how we can do it and apply it to different things like a design system tooling or just kind of automation of kind of repetitive actions and things like that. So yeah, it's been a really great and designers now are finding kind of new ways to make products in a kind of just make it, I suppose we've always wanted to do, but couldn't. And now those opportunities are there. And so I'd recommend anybody just gets out there and starts building things because it's really good fun. Heck yeah. So there's so much AI slop that's out there because everyone's just, you know, using AI to generate like, you know, output and everything looks very generic. So what do you use for design inspiration? There's a lot of things out there, but I suppose one of the kind of products we always go back to is Mobbin. So let me just bring it up here. So it's been, we I've used it on and off for the last few years, seen it grow from a few products to now hundreds and hundreds of apps. Now websites as well. At Tesco, I suppose we're thinking a lot about the kind of e-commerce side, obviously, so shopping, food and drinks, but the kind of navigation makes it so easy to find what, what you're looking for. If I want to focus on a particular type of screen, so would it be like a home screen? There's a, it's a classic one that we'd be looking at. I was also playing around with this earlier when I could just be like, okay, show me the buttons as well. And just see it, getting that inspiration for all of those things. Um, and then... It's also great for things like, we're always spending a lot of time thinking about our competitors. What are they doing? What can we learn from them? But with a, the app store, especially, you can only see the apps that are available in your country. Whereas with Mobbin, now I can see, or I can have a look at Swiggy in India, and Target, maybe. Swiggy. Yeah, that's, that's definitely one we've talked about. And you know, there's so many things we can learn from all the great designers around the world and you can see this is a great place to see their output but also you see what's live as opposed to just designs so yeah it's definitely an invaluable resource for us do you recommend other design teams get marvin subscription yeah definitely it's we come back to it weekly so it's certainly something that is a kind of core part of our design process especially at the beginning they've got a great little plugin so you can 
you'll often find people's Figma files are have those they're like a research page or whatever and it'll just be you know screens from mobbing that are dumped on there and that can really i suppose an easy way to create a mood board or something like that so yeah it's definitely something we keep using thank you so much rob for coming on sneak peek and showing us how to vibe code figma plugins with cursor been an absolute pleasure joe thank you hey this is jay it means the world to me that you watch this video if you want to unlock the AI design and growth to design interviews with designers at some of the top companies in the world, then head on over to sneakpeek.design and subscribe to the newsletter.